All right, welcome to the 107th event of the Otara University of Commerce English Lecture Series. Today, we welcome singer-songwriter, narrator, and multi-talented artist, Delena Miyazaki. And for the first part of the two-part event today, she is going to be giving us a talk called Finding Your Creative Voice and the Courage to Use It. Please welcome Ms. Delena Miyazaki. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Testing one, two. Okay, that's better. So, good morning. My name is Delena Miyazaki, and you may already know me, even though it's the first time we've met. I do a lot of work in Hokkaido, especially Sapporo, for the cities, and I do announcements for the buses, trains, and many places. For example, You've maybe heard this before. The next stop is Sapporo Station. The next stop is Otaru Station. Please be careful not to leave any of your belongings behind. Anyone heard that before? Okay, somebody in the back. <laughs> yes, so I do work with JR, JR Bus, Hokuto Bus, also Esta, Pivo, Veda. Let's see, we also can hear my voice at the ropeway in Moyoyama. Also the ski jump, Okurayama ski jump, uh, the chocolate factory, and many other places like Sapporo Art Park. Also on TV, you might see me every day with a commercial for Oikawa Shichiten, Oikawa Pawn Shops. So anyway, that's just a little bit about me and what I do. And narration is a big part of my work, but it's not my biggest passion. I'd like to share a little bit about that with you today. So, first of all, I wanted to share this quote by Picasso. Good artist copy, great artist steal. And I'm going to be borrowing a lot of information from people that I think are far more talented and wise than myself today, so please be prepared to spend a little time with the thief as I will be borrowing, if not stealing, some great ideas today. First, I want to ask you some questions. What do you see in your wildest dreams? You're all very young here, or young at heart. <laughs> so what is it that you want to do with your life? Why are you here studying in the university? Do you have a dream? Something that you've always wanted to try? Something that maybe scares you to try? Well, for me, the thing that I used to dream about and still do is music. Now, I believe that this quote is quite true. The only unique contribution that we will ever make in this world will be born of our creativity. What's unique about the world? What's unique about us? Is it just coming to school and showing up? Or going to work and showing up? Doing the same thing that everyone else is doing? Are these the things that really impact and change the world? I'd like to think it's the creative things that we do the unique things, the things that stand out from the rest of the world, that really impact what we're doing. And so I offer this. When I was a child, uh, this is me at about five years old, and my mother, I used to be extremely shy. I was so shy that I didn't have any friends to speak of. No one believes me because I'm usually telling this story from a stage, but it's very true. Now, when you're creating things, it can be very scary because people might not like it. You have to really put yourself out there when you show somebody your work. The thing is that mothers always have to like it. I think it's a rule in the parenting handbook. And my mother's always been very supportive of me. But she couldn't help me 
when it came to my fears about how people would accept or reject me. And I always felt like maybe I was a little different the way that I thought and the things that I wanted to do in my life and that it wasn't exactly what everyone else was doing. So this quote by Brene Brown, that vulnerability is the birthplace of creativity has been very important to my life. You see, you can't be creative without being vulnerable. And I know vulnerability is a big word, even for me. And there's a big misconception about it. Most people think vulnerability means weakness. And it's a bad thing. But you can't be vulnerable. Especially if you're a man, you know, you should be a football player, a baseball player, you should be strong. Being vulnerable is seen as a bad thing, but heroes, even superheroes, or your everyday heroes, like the police and firefighters and rescuers, are they ever really heroes without risking something, without putting themselves in a place where they can get hurt? Now that's a definition of vulnerability, is that you actually allow yourself to be open, and then you overcome. And so, yes, it is a vulnerable place to be creative, but it is the only place where new things are born and new ideas that change this world. And so art can change us, and we can change the world. He says, the future belongs to us, and I think that art is a force that can change the world. Have you ever been changed by art? Especially when I talk about art, a lot of the time today I'll be talking about music. Do you have a song? That's a very special song that when you hear it, it takes you to a place. It brings back a memory from your childhood or a special person in your life. A time that maybe was very hard, but the music helped you get through it. Are you thinking of a favorite song? Does anyone have a song that they can say that, yes, this song really impacted me or changed the way I thought about something? That's the power of art. It's the power of music. And we all have the ability to create things like that inside ourselves. So, this is me. You might recognize the Sapporo factory. I will actually be performing there later this evening. And I told you that I was very shy growing up. In fact, there was a story I meant to share. When I was about 10 years old, I had an opportunity to sing a solo in a children's choir. They asked, Delana, would you sing this solo for us? I really wanted to do it, but I was scared. I thought, no, I'm not a singer. I'm not really a good singer. I can't do it. And so I said, no. So my best friend sang the solo instead. I don't want to say that I was jealous, because it was a Christian summer camp, but <laughs> I was. And I never forgot the way that I felt saying no to an opportunity of something I really wanted to do. Now, that wasn't the last time I said no to opportunities. Certainly not, not a shy girl like me. But if I talk about that, then it segues into this violin picture. So I started playing the violin in junior high school. I'm not exactly sure why, but I had this desire that I wanted to either play the violin or the saxophone. And I could not make up my mind until the last minute. But finally, I decided, okay, violin. And it was a very serendipitous choice because I have had a lot of lung problems, which means playing the saxophone would have been pretty difficult for me at a younger age. I still love the sound of it, and someday I hope to get one and add that to my list of instruments that I do play. But the violin, from the age of about 12, became my instrument. And the thing is, as much as I enjoyed learning it in the public school orchestra, I didn't like to practice. Anyone else kind of felt that way before? Like, um, yeah, practice is not much fun. 
Maybe not. <laughs> well, for me, that's how I felt because I saw the other kids in the class that were just amazing. And I thought, well, I'm not like that. They must be born with it. I'll never be that good, so what's the point in really practicing? What's the point of really putting a lot of effort just to be disappointed? And so I didn't really practice much outside of class. However, when I was in high school, they built a special school next door to my public high school. It was called a magnet school. The idea of like a magnet bringing things together. This was a magnet school for the arts. They had five departments of visual arts, like painting, sculpting. They also had media arts for making videos and TV shows. They had dance, they had drama, and they had music with a brass band and a full orchestra. Now, the first summer when they opened the school for auditions, only 200 students from seven schools, which had about two to 3,000 students each, could get into this program for the whole five departments. I wasn't there that summer to audition. I don't think I would have auditioned even if I had been there because I wasn't that good. But I was really lucky because they decided to send the orchestra's class from the public school over to the magnet school. And just by that lucky chance, all of us got to have the best teacher in the district. And he was really great. He encouraged us that we could grow, we could get better. And he invited all of the students who could play, including me, into the main orchestra. Of course, what did I do? I said no. <laughs> I said no because it was already one or two weeks into the school year. I didn't like change. I didn't want to change my schedule. And maybe a little altruistically or maybe pridefully, I thought, if I go, there won't be anyone left in the public school orchestra who can play. No offense to my friends that were in there. <laughs> Still, I stayed. And then the next year with the junior uh, high school schedule, I was swamped. I had no extra room to add any other classes beyond the ones I had to take. And so I just stayed in the regular orchestra again. But my teacher really encouraged me to audition that summer, and so I did. Now, the junior year, I had played viola for a change, just because they needed one. So I practiced viola for most of the summer. Not every day, not every other day, but some. However, I didn't bother using sheet music. So when I got back to school and I realized that I'd been accepted for a viola part in the Magnet School Orchestra, I had completely forgotten how to read viola music over the summer. Now, what worked out really well for me is that they had one more student, a violist, who really wanted to be in the program, but there was no space. But they had two open chairs in second violin, which is what I'd always played before. So my teacher asked me, Delena, would you move? to the violin section for us so this other student can have a chance. I gladly took it because I remembered how to read <laughs> violin music. And from that, I was inducted into a special program, three hours a day of music. Music theory, full orchestra practice, private sessions with tutors, practice, or a chamber orchestra. Even in my senior year of high school with all the hard level English classes, math and science, my most difficult class was that freshman level music theory 101. I will never forget it. And so you have to wonder what happened between me being so shy to being on a stage like this. Well, about that same time in high school when I entered the program, when I was about 15, I got sick of it. I really decided that it just does not pay to be shy. And so I started to break out of my shell that vulnerability we were talking about, yeah, I decided it was worth it to go ahead and show my true self to people. And I was not a popular kid. I wasn't a sporty kid. I was uh, one of the outliers, you might say. But I did have a nice community of friends. Now, this is the key point, it's mindset. That's what changed for me when I said, it doesn't pay to be shy. There's nothing good about it. What is your mindset? I want to do a little quiz. So does everybody have something to write with? Great. 
So you don't have to write down these questions, but if you would, please write down the number of the question, and then your one to ten. Do you strongly agree or disagree with each statement? Is that okay? Everybody understand the process? So I have six questions. I'd like everybody to take their paper and pen and write one, two, three, four, five, six. And then when we read the question, just if you think yes, I think that's true. Yes, I agree. Then somewhere close to ten, how much you agree? If you think that's not true at all, no way. Then on the other side, don't agree at all. So you can see the first question. How much do you think it's true? The most amazing singers in the world are just born with it. No, that's not true. It's a one. Oh yeah, I agree with that. It's ten. Okay. Everybody good with number one? All right. Uh, if we need to go back to it, I will. But number two. Even naturally gifted singers can improve with practice and applied technique. Means even if you have a good voice and it's easy for you, that you can still get better. So do you think, yeah, it's possible you can become a better singer if you practice and have technique? Or no, no, you, you're either born with it or you're not. Don't worry, you won't be graded on this. Okay, moving on to number three. You really can't change the quality of your voice. It means your voice is your voice. You can't change it. Can't make it better. Yes or no? Okay, moving on. Four. A person's ability to grow, learn, and persevere is more valuable than innate talent. And that just means that your God-given talent, as we'd say, what you're born with, is not as important as your ability to grow, or to learn, or to press on and persevere. Okay? Five. Only musical geniuses can come up with amazing melodies for songs. Amateurs just can't do it. So think about the, your favorite songs, your favorite melody. For example, everybody knows the Everybody knows that classical melody. That was a genius who came up with that. Is it only geniuses that can do that? Or could amateurs do it? So if you think it's not possible for a non-professional, non-genius to do that, then you strongly agree. OK, and the last question. No matter what your ability is, effort is what ignites that ability and turns it into accomplishment. Again, this just means that Wherever you're starting, however good or bad you are, it's the effort that you use that really turns your ability into something and makes you a success, turns it into accomplishment. Okay, so going back over these, on number one, if you strongly agree anywhere above the five mark, six mark, then this statement is what we would call a fixed mindset. There are two mindsets I want to talk about today. There's fixed mindset and growth mindset. So this one is a fixed mindset statement. So if you, want, if you had six or higher, maybe write down an F next to your thing. If you had five or lower on number one, then write a G for growth. Okay, so if you had six, seven, eight, nine, ten, write an F next to number one for fixed mindset. If you had one, two, three, four, or five, then write a G next to it for growth. 
Number two, even naturally gifted singers can improve with practice and apply technique. This is a growth mindset statement. So if you had six or higher on this statement, then write a G. If you had one to five, that's more fixed mindset, please write an F for number two. Three, you really can't change the quality of your voice. Again, this is a fixed mindset statement. So if you had six or higher, write an F. If you had one, two, three, four, or five, write a G. And four, a person's ability to grow, learn, and persevere is more valuable than innate talent. This is a growth mindset statement. See a pattern here? So if you had six or higher, write a G, a letter G. If you had one, two, three, or four, or five, then write letter F for fixed. Five, only musical geniuses can come up with amazing melodies for songs. Amateurs just can't do it. This is a fixed mindset. So again, if you had six or higher, write an F. If you had one, two, three, or four, or five, write a G. And the last one, no matter what your ability is, effort is what ignites that ability and turns it into accomplishment. So this one is a growth mindset statement. If you had six or higher, write a G. One, two, three, four, or five, then write an F. And I want you to just look at your answers. What was the balance? I mean, did you have more G's or more F's? Because if you have more F's for the fixed mindset or stronger F's, then that kind of indicates maybe the way you were taught. Some of your family dynamics could have this impact, but that means you're, you're thinking that life is just the way it is and you are just the way you are and you can't really change it. And even if you want something that, you know, it's maybe not going to happen, why practice? Why bother? And it becomes really hard to succeed at the things you want because you get stuck. However, if you had more G's, if you're a growth mindset, that means the options are endless for you because you know you can grow. And you're not here at college just to pass the tests and go on to get a better job, but you're learning and you're changing. And every day is an opportunity to get better. And this is what changed for me. I can't pinpoint when it happened exactly. <clears throat> I think some of my teachers, especially those great orchestra teachers, had a lot to do with it. But I definitely changed from thinking, what's the point? I'll never be that good. Why bother practicing? To thinking, yes, if I practice a little today, a little tomorrow, and a little more the next day and the next day, I will get better. I can be a professional. I can achieve the things I want to. So looking at mindset, uh, this is a nice quote by Carol S. Dweck, who wrote the book, Mindset. I highly recommend you read it, or if you do what I do, listen to the audiobook while you're on a train or in the car. When you enter a mindset, you enter a new world. In one world, the world of fixed traits or fixed mindset, success is about proving smart or talented, validating yourself. In the other, the world of changing qualities or the growth mindset, it's about stretching yourself to learn something new, developing yourself. And this is what I find is the key. So we had these first two questions, right? Who here knows the artist Ed Sheeran? Yeah, okay, some people. I mean, he's like the biggest seller anywhere right now, I think. So you should probably know him. Lots of popular songs like The Shape of You and Gallery Girl. I mean, there's too many to list. So if this works, I want you to skip the Google ad. And here's a little interview.
Okay, so did you catch what he said at the end there? He says, you know what? I did practice. And then he kind of joked, I probably needed it. Well, we can tell from that really long ago sample of his early work, I'm assuming, that even Ed Sheeran wasn't born with it. In fact, I think you'll find most of your favorite artists were probably not born with it. It just looks that way. Because maybe from an early age, they had a growth mindset. And they had that ability to just keep growing and growing. Okay. So back to the presentation. Are you guys uh, having fun today? Seems like I've lost it. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so that's Ed Sheeran's I Needed to Practice moment. All right, so back to Carol S. Dweck, the author of Mindset. These are some quotes that I really love by her. This is something I know for a fact. You have to work hardest for the things you love most. Is there anything you love? Maybe some of you were on a baseball team, or you are. Or maybe you're playing the piano as a kid, even now. Maybe you love reading, writing. Whatever it is, I think a lot of times because we love it, it doesn't feel like work in the beginning. But it is work, and that's the amazing thing. They say if you love your work, then you're never actually like, working. Well, I guess it's some people's definition, but you do have to work hard for it. The next quote, actually, people with the fixed mindset expect ability to show up on its own before any learning takes place. I can definitely see this in myself, where I would expect things to just, if I couldn't do it right away, that meant I wasn't meant to do it. If it wasn't easy for me to play the violin or the guitar, oh, then I should just give up. And that's why I didn't start learning a lot of things until later in my life, because I didn't have the growth mindset to really pick it up. And now success is about being your best self, not about being better than others. Failure is an opportunity, not a condemnation. Effort is the key to success. Who's here is afraid of failing? Me. <laughs> I really don't like the idea of failure. failure. At least I didn't. But over the years of getting more and more of a growth mindset, I've come to see my mistakes. And let me tell you about some mistakes. Uh, one of the jobs that I do that is not especially well known is I am a wedding pastor. So I get up in front of audiences of about this size or more sometimes, and 95% in Japanese ask people if they want to become husband and wife. Now that is a high stress job because you're not allowed to make mistakes. But everybody makes mistakes. Even when you are talking and you suddenly mess up a line, you have to keep going. And you can't really let it show on your face that, oh, I just messed up the whole, like, chikaimasu ka? Hai, chikaimasu? You know, that wedding. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. So the thing is, if you make a mistake, you go, OK, I'll remember that next time. Next time, I definitely won't be doing that. And you grow. And you don't let it hold you back. That's a wonderful thing about a growth mindset. Also, I felt for years when I was younger, like comparing myself to other people. And, oh, they're much better at me than the violin. So, again, why should I try? Or, well, at least I'm better than he is. You know, when I was in the orchestra, in that special program, when I got into it, when they asked me to take a second violin seat, there were only two seats left, and they were in the back. And so for most of my career in that program, I was the worst violinist in the entire school. But I was still there. And so, yeah, that is making the whole, I'm better than the people who didn't get into the program comparison, perhaps. 
But you know, it was an amazing thing just to be part of it. And so many of the kids in that program had a growth mindset. And they were like, Delana, no, you don't have to feel bad that you're the last chair. You're here, you're in the program, we're all special, we all are putting in an effort. And it was really an amazing experience. And so back to my true passion, music, the mood-altering, non-fattening wonder drug. Ask your doctor if music is right for you. Common side effects include, but in our limit to spontaneous happiness, increased memory and motor function, connection to others, movement of the feet and head, and the occasional persistence of catchy melodies. I just love that. Okay, so now I'd like to perform a song for you. And uh, talking about challenges, uh, this picture is from something I did this summer, a Facebook Live Music series, where I went online live to the world and performed for eight days a song every evening just to get feedback, just to throw my creative work to the world. And I'd like to do one of those songs for you now. I was so happy there was like a tall chair here, but now I'm not so sure. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's actually pretty good, but a uh, new experience for me. And just a side note, I was feeling like time was flying recently, and I hear it's not really supposed to happen until you're older, and I don't feel that old, so I researched it and read that one of the reasons it feels like time really speeds along as you get older is because you're not experiencing new things. And so, I love the opportunity to experience new things like falling off my chair in front of a large audience. Uh, the song is called, That's All I Want. Yeah. 
performing this afternoon in the Commons area, but as it's coming up close to Christmas time, I thought I would sing one more in this uh, impromptu live, in the presentation. Uh, the last song was an original, That's All I Want, and if you count the lyrics, I'd just like to say that it talks about the things you find in nature that are always together, and the fact that you and I belong together and that's all I want. The next song is a happy Christmas tune that I wrote one summer day, not that long ago, and it's called Mistletoe Destiny. It tells a nice story about how a couple met and fallen, fell in love. Midnight 
thank you very much. And so, of course, those being original songs that you've never heard before in your life, you might not know what to think of them, but it wasn't something I was born able to do, that's for sure. And every artist that you love and every songwriter that you enjoy the work of was not really born with it either. It's craft. And it's something that I think anybody can learn to do if they have a desire to. I don't know if you've seen the movie August Rush, uh, the famous Roman Williams was an actor in that and it was an amazing music-based music movie and he talks with passion this quote you know what music is God's little reminder that there's something else besides us in the universe harmonic connection between all living beings everywhere even the stars and that's a little of what music is for me I've been talking with you and trying to make eye contact and feel a connection, and it's there. But I know when I'm on the other side of the music, listening to it, there's a connection that happens the instant you hear something that you like, the instant you hear something fresh. I mean, music has a way to communicate things that just words can't. And even though I know listening to any song, even if it's in your native language the first time, it's hard to catch all the words. So I'm sure you didn't catch a lot of what I was singing just now but I really hope you could feel it that you could feel something even if the words weren't hundred percent clear the first time okay now this old looking instrument <laughs> who's familiar with the old-fashioned style answering machine yeah so ha Nowadays, everybody's got their smartphones, right? Don't really worry about voicemail recordings and stuff, but if you've ever used an answering machine at your house, your parents' house maybe, and you've recorded the message, thank you for calling the Miyazakis, no one is available to take your call right now, and then you play back your own voice, and it just sounds so weird. Like, you, have you recorded your voice maybe on your phone? or you listen to it on a video or something, and you just go, that's not me. That doesn't sound right. Have that experience? Like, oh, is that how my voice sounds? I think almost everyone feels that way. And there's a scientific reason for that. Um, the fact that your ears are so much closer to your mouth is one point. But your voice tends to sound much more resonant and deep to yourself because you're also getting a lot of the sound conduction through bones. And it's just a scientific thing that your voice is going to sound a little richer coming from your own head than when it's projected out. And I didn't like my voice that much either when I heard it <laughs> recorded for the first time. But then I started doing something. I started recording my voice a lot when I would have song ideas and I didn't want to forget them. I had an old-fashioned tape recorder. I would even take that in the car on my drive between Florida and North Carolina for college and record ideas driving down the highway. Now I use this. <laughs> and I got used to my voice. And I even started to like it. And also that recording and listening back kind of helped me see what I liked more about my voice when I used it some ways and what I didn't like and to kind of develop it. And here's the interesting definition from Wikipedia about the human voice the sound of each individual's voice is entirely unique not only because of the actual shape and size of an individual's vocal cords but also due to the size and shape of the rest of that person's body especially the vocal tract and the manner in which the speech sounds are habitually formed and articulated in other words everyone has a really unique voice of course you can mimic it and try to sound like somebody else but really your voice is almost as unique as a fingerprint and speaking of unique voices you may or may not know who all of these artists are but you can't deny they have unique 
voices. Bob Dylan is not actually the first person to, the first uh, songwriter to win a Nobel Prize. He's the second, but the first was back in 1913, I believe. So not as well known. But he's definitely made a huge impact on the world. And if you don't know his voice, then I had a link here. Where did it go? Okay, so that's Bob Dylan in his much younger years, and you couldn't miss his voice for anyone else's once you've heard it. He may not be everybody's cup of tea. <laughs> uh, you might not really care for that kind of voice, but it's the uniqueness in it that really propelled him into that well-known stardom, I think. But I'm sure he probably heard from more than one person that you're not going to be a star with that voice. There's no way it's not the popular sound. But it's his unique sound. And uh, the same thing with this artist you probably know from the Southern All-Stars, Keisuke Kuwata. Now, what's unique with him is the way he pronounces things. Okay, so what I find unique about his voice is that he intentionally pronounces even his Japanese with a kind of English accentation or intonation. And I, I heard from his history that he was told, you'll never make it in this industry. You don't have the voice. That style's not going to be popular. But they're one of Japan's most successful bands. And he's one of the most successful songwriters. You may not know this artist, um, Haley Williams. She fronted the band called Paramore. And she's got an excellent voice. I don't know that anybody would say she doesn't. But she also has a kind of unique way of phrasing her words and the accentation on that. And uh, let's take a little listen to a live concert she did here in Japan. And you might know this song from the first Twilight movie.
Okay, so I do not sound anything like Haley Williams <laughs> when I normally sing, but with the way that she shapes her vowels and the way she sings, I can mimic that. Ha! Not in her key though. Like, um, what was it? How do I? No, wrong key, I'm sorry. How do I decide what's right when you're always on my mind? I'm tired of taking sides all the time. So, like, I never say all oh, when I say all. But if you play with the vowels, then you can really find your own unique voice. And I was able to do that with some vocal techniques and training. And there's one artist who's really influenced the way that I sing now. And I'd like to just give you a little example of how one song completely changed the way that I perform. The artist that really influenced me is Nora Jones and her song, Don't Know Why. When I finally learned to sing it and play it, she's got this amazing, rich vocal tone and texture. And so my voice tends to be quite clear, which is why I'm a good narrator. I have a very standard American accent from the Midwest, uh, not a particularly distinctive accent per se, nothing like the, hi y'all, I'm from Texas, or, uh, I'm a Georgia peach, nice to meet you. Got some pecan pie. Uh, or the, hey, California surfing so cool, dude. Or New Yorkers, you know, real tough and stuff. Or even the Boston famous, park the car in the parking lot. I mean, these are all American accents. And mine is it's right in the middle, fairly standard. So, Nora Jones song. Jones and her unique vocal influence and what it's done for me. And so I don't know if any of you like to sing or aspire to be singers or songwriters in the future, but if you want to do anything from a stage, at some point you're probably going to have to deal with stage fright. I know I have had to deal with it. So, some more heavily borrowed, if not stolen, ideas. Uh, this is from Mel Robbins. She's the author of the book, The Five Second Rule. And she discovered this thing, which is actually quite scientific based. She just didn't know it for years, that if you count down 
five, four, three, two, one. And then take action on the thing that you know instinctively you should do. It'll short circuit the thing in your brain that tells you not to do it. And you can even rewire your brain to take action rather than get stilted in fear. She says, if you only ever did the things you don't want to do, you'd have everything you ever wanted. Meaning the things that we don't want to do usually are the ones that will get us to our goals the fastest. So the five second rule is the moment you have an instinct to act on a goal, you must physically move within five seconds or your brain will stop you. Five, four, three, two, one, go. And if you look at this little diagram, the character says, I'll write an article. To the right, your brain killing your idea. Your brain after five seconds, you can't do that. You're not a writer. You don't know how to write. I'm pretty sure you won't finish it again. And you think, yeah, writing is a bad idea. And then what just happened to my day? <laughs> but if you follow the five second rule over to the left, five, four, three, two, one. Type, 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 and yay, I'm done. That's how it works. So the next time you have a book report to do for school or some other studying, and you're thinking, ah, oh, five, four, three, two, one, and you go. And you'll find yourself accomplishing a lot more things. And so if you're an artist and you're standing there getting ready to go on the stage and you still have a choice whether to do it or not, just five, four, three, two, one, go. Don't ever count up because there's no stopping. You just keep going. So always count down and like a rocket, just shoot off. Now somebody else that I really have gained a lot of wisdom from is this lady, Brene Brown. I believe she has the number two most viewed TED talk of all time on the power of vulnerability. She says, authenticity is the daily practice of letting go of who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. Also, perfectionism is a self-destructive and addictive belief system that fuels this primary thought. If I look perfect and do everything perfectly, I can avoid or minimize the painful feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. Now I face this. I can tell you, and I'm sure you realize, I didn't play any of those songs perfectly. One, I'm a, not a morning person. <laughs> In fact, uh, I usually don't go to bed until 3 or 4 in the morning a lot of nights because I'm up writing music or working on translation work with my husband who's a night owl manga artist. So, yes, uh, maybe not my best, but if I waited for everything to be perfect, then I wouldn't maybe ever get on the stage. And if you keep saying, oh, I have to wait until my art is perfect, until my work is perfect, until my English is perfect, before I can have that conversation, before I can take that trip. You'll be waiting forever. So don't let perfectionism or this idea that it's gonna save you from embarrassment and hardship and blame and shame. Don't let that keep you from doing things because those things will come either way, but it's how you take them and how you let them affect them that's really gonna change everything. Now this is a great bit of advice. Sometimes the bravest and most important thing you can do is just show up. So I applaud all of you today that you actually showed up here. That is saying something. You could have stayed in bed. You could have been doing something else if you really wanted to, but you're here. And I'm here. And just as showing up and being here together is a, an amazing step into the future and what we can be. And real courage is to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. And that's what I try to do with my music. Okay, so I would like to move into the thing I started out with, which is about recording and narration. Um, there are a few things that can be very practical and helpful if you ever find yourself in a recording booth trying to uh, make announcements for your favorite train station or something else. Uh, one thing I've noticed and you may have to when you try to speak English versus Japanese. When you have the Japanese, you can speak Japanese without actually having to move your lips half as much, I feel, as English. In fact, if you speaking, even native speakers, if you're speaking for three or four hours, your face will feel tired. Your cheeks will get tired. 
And so we have a lot of plosives like B's and P's and T's that make a popping sound on the microphone. A tool that's helped me greatly is a simple thing called a pop guard. I didn't bring one today because it's not necessary with this kind of microphone, but microphones in recording studios are, like this one you can see in the picture, are very sensitive. And I've been in studios where they didn't have a pop guard because most of the time in Japanese you don't really need it as much. And have had to swallow sounds, for example, like Sapporo, the P on that, like Sapporo, like be really careful with the voice. And that's hard work to do, and it doesn't sound as natural. So there are lots of tools, the kind of microphone you use, a pop guard, even having a comfortable seat that doesn't squeak, making sure that your jacket doesn't make a brushing sound, you know, when you're moving your arms. Taking a deep breath at the right time so you have enough air to get through the whole phrase. There are a lot of wonderful techniques that you can learn. I learned most of mine from experience, but I found that recently there's a whole community where you can study these things, especially for people that read audiobooks, which is one of my future goals. Now here's some other dream work, since we were talking about dreams and things you'd like to do. Working in television. Uh, two years ago, I did a J-Trip plan reporter's job with NHK World and discovered that I loved it. As a songwriter, it's really easy for me to be stuck in my head and thinking about songs and creating stuff all the time. But as a reporter, you're looking around going, what? What's interesting here? What can I share? Who can I talk to? What's going on? And you're just, all these antenna are instantly going up. And I loved that presence. So you might have seen some of these things. Uh, here at the bottom, well, here, let me go up to this. I say. We live in the good life. How do you have the Okay, so I, I sang for a Grandia Seiko Mart commercial. Uh, you can see on the left corner, last year I was in a TV show called Hokkaido no Chikara Namara Inbound with Yakumaru kun. That was quite an interesting experience. I've also been on TV shows like Gaigoku Jin, Oksamo wa Gaigoku Jin, and I Mada Housing other things from TV stations in Tokyo. Uh, this commercial is still running on a daily basis, I believe. My friend took this video. I've still never seen it. Uh, this is my website that's popping up for some reason, so if you want to check out some free music from me, please. Today, the Oikawa Pawn Shop is not only with jewelry, watches, and big name brands, but a variety of other goods as well. They also offer direct sale payment services within Sapporo City. Welcome to Oikawa Pawn Shop. Okay, so get to do little interesting things like that. This commercial. Just punch it. Punch cool. When you've worked up a good sweat or need a refreshing cool down, anytime things get hot. To knock out the heat. Just punch it. Punch. Wow. <laughs> punch. It's so cold. That's amazing. It stays cool up to 30 minutes. Take it anywhere. We freeze and reuse as a cooler pack. Punch the pouch. For an instant icy cool down. So you can see that was a lot of voiceover work in that commercial. And anyway, there's there's been a lot of things like that. I've I've done work with uh, Pivo, Jushunen, Kinenbi announcements, and other things on TV. And I look forward to doing more work like that in the future. I would never have known that I enjoy TV work so much if I had been my old self and said. 
no, I can't do that. I've never had an acting class in my life. No, you have to take those chances when they come. And so I hope that, like me, you won't be the shy 10-year-old who said, no, no, I can't sing, I can't get up in front of people, I can't show people my art. I hope that you will have the courage and the vulnerability to stand up and share your true self with the world and find your own unique creative voice and the courage to use it. Thank you. I'm Delana Miyazaki.